All right. So I'm trying, I'm trying now to connect the antiderivative over to what we did last class with all those sums, right? Y'all remember what we did though? I mean, you did the quiz, right? Cut it up, a bunch of rectangles. So what I'm gonna try and get to right now is the Riemann sums a general formula. What, I, what we just did, right? What we were just doing, I would consider that to be the antiderivatives, those rules and stuff, trivial. That stuff's trivial. You, you'll get it, you'll figure it out. It's very mechanical, adding fractions, things like that. There's a couple little hoops you have to jump through. No big deal. You'll get, you'll get it, all right? If you work at it, you'll get it. This sort of thing is a much higher level thinking. So ask me a question if you are stuck on something. P math majors, computer science majors, this, this type of stuff you want to be able to understand. All right. What I'm trying to do is take that quiz problem that you had and I want to do it in a general form. So instead of me giving you like x cubed and you coming up with a formula, I want to give you just f and not tell you what it is and you get be able to come up with a formula for it. So this is the derivation of a general formula. So let f of x be a function on some interval a, b. I want you to help me out here, okay? If, when I, I'm going to turn and ask questions, see if, see if you can help me. So I have some function defined on a closed interval, something like this. And just for now, I'm going to assume that you know, this function is well behaved. It's not doing anything crazy. It's continuous, right? Draw it without picking up your pencil. Just really, really a nice function. And we want to try and come up with the Riemann sums to figure out the area underneath. So what did we do with our x cubed? I mean, what, I know we did it, we started with one rectangle, then two, then three, but we got it to a point where we had how many rectangles? N. N. So let's start there with this, okay? Start there. I'm gonna cut this into N rectangles, right? N rectangles, N of them. I would like to know, first of all, the width of each of those rectangles. How wide is each rectangle? So I'm going to cut into n rectangles. How wide is each rectangle? Think about it. Now in the problem that you had at home, what was the interval that I gave you, the, the x cubed? It was 0 to 2, was it, right? And so we took 0 to 2, right? And we cut it into n pieces. So how wide was each one? It was 2 over n, wasn't it? But here, I'm not starting at 0 and going to 2. I'm starting at a and going to b. So first of all, how wide is this? How wide is... is from here to here. So if it went from 1 to 4, how wide would it be? 3. If it went from 2 to 6, it would be? 4. four. So how are you getting that? B minus, a. B minus A, right? So the total width is B minus A. That's how wide the whole thing is. And then you're cutting it into how many rectangles? N. So shouldn't the width of each rectangle be B minus A over N? It's the width of the whole thing divided into N equal parts. That's the width of each rectangle. Any, anyone have a problem with that? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these rectangles, I'm going to just zoom in on it. Here it is. Here's one of those rectangles. So we're saying the width of this, how wide that is, is that, right? Now I'm, for the sake of where we're headed, I'm going to um, write something else out here on the board. Next to this, I want you to just call this triangle X. Well, what, what does that stand for in math? It's the delta, Greek delta, so, but we, um, not Greek delta, the delta symbol stands for change. So this is the change in X. This is how much our X changes by 
when you go from one rectangle to the next. And that should be the same for all rectangles, right? Okay. Next thing. Didn't I need to know this right corner of the rectangle so that I could plug it in to my function and see how tall it was? So how, do, how could you describe to me all of these right endpoints? I need a way of listing them out. So I'll put that question up here. Describe the bottom right corners. So tell me about this first one. Tell me about the first bottom right corner. Where is it? On the number line, where is it? It's, it's, it starts here at A, right? And then how much did you add to it? You added the delta x, didn't you? So like to get to this point, you have to first start at the origin. You have to go out A first, right? That's A. And then you have to add one width of a rectangle. So here's, I'm just going to put for the first rectangle, the bottom right hand corner is A plus that delta x. So it's A and then one width of a rectangle, which is really A plus B minus A over N, isn't it? That'll get you to the bottom right hand corner of the first rectangle. Tell me about the second rectangle. What do you do to get there? Yeah, go out A again, but instead of adding one delta X, add two of them. That'll get you to the bottom right corner of the second one. Does that make sense? Okay, so my second rectangle should be A plus two delta X's, which is A plus two B minus A over N's. Right? And then what would the next one be? Three of them, then four, then five, then six. Agreed? So I, I don't want to erase any of this, so I'm just going to say over here the third bottom right corner would be A plus three B minus A over N's. And then as I dot, dot, dot down, I finally get to that nth rectangle, right? The nth one. And I'll be at A plus what? N, B minus A over N's. Do you see the similarity from what you did on your quiz? Do you, can you kind of see the connection here? But we're generalizing it, which is much more powerful than doing it one time for each problem. If you can come up with a general formula, and that's what mathematics and all the engineering and sciences are all about, is generalizing things. Being able to see it in a big picture instead of just focus down on one little problem. All right, next thing. Tell me about the height of the rectangles. So I'm now interested in this piece right here. How high is each rectangle? So height of the rectangles. So let's talk about the first one. How high is the first one? How high is that first rectangle? It's F of that bottom right corner, isn't it? You go to this bottom right corner, you plug that number into the function, that tells you how high you are. So the height of the first rectangle is going to be F of a plus B minus A over N, like that, right? Plugging that point, that point right there, the bottom right corner, into the function. The height of the second rectangle is what? F of A plus 2 B minus A over N's, right? And then the height of the third one is F of A plus 3 B minus A over N's. And then you keep going, right? Yes? Uh, since we know 
know what delta x is, can't we just write two delta x? We will. I'm not not there yet, but I yes, you could. You'll see why in, in when we do our first example. Okay, so what's the height of the nth rectangle? It's f of a plus n, b minus a over n's. We're almost there. What's the area of the first rectangle now? So now I'm ready to talk about the area. It's the base, right, times the height, isn't it? It's the base times the height. So the area of rectangles. The first one will be the base times the height. I'm going to do the height first. I'm going to write the height first. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll stick to the way I have it in here. Um, the width of it was b minus a over n times the height, which is f of a plus b minus a over n, like that, right? So that's your width times your height. That's your first rectangle. The second one will be what? Second rectangle. Does this change? Nope, your width is still the same. So b minus a over n, f of a plus 2 b minus a over n's. And then the third one will be b minus a over n plus, I mean times f of a plus 3 b minus a over n's. And I keep going, right? Until I get to the nth one where it's b minus a over n times f of a plus n b minus a over n's. And that is primed and ready for summation notation, isn't it? That is just, it's a bunch of things that I'm going to add up. They're, almo they're all almost identical except for one little thing, right? What's the only thing changing in each of these? Coefficient. That right there. There's a 1 there, 2 there, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way out to n, isn't there? So my general, my total area of the rectangles, right? Of the, rent, of the n rectangles would be, in summation notation, sum k equals 1 to n of b minus a over n, f of a plus what? k times b minus a over n. Close it off. So what happens here is you start with k being 1. That's 1. That's your first rectangle. Then k is 2. You add 2 of those. Then 3, then 4. And then you get all the way out till you go to n. Do you all see that? It creates these. Shh. No questions? You're all good? And what we also said from last class is that if you want the true area, what do you have to do? What do you have to do? Make it make infinite number of rectangles, right? So the actual area, right? The true area under F on the interval AB is the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation k equals 1 to n of b minus a over n times f of a plus k times b minus a over n. Close it. Now, what do y'all think of this? I want to know what you feel in here. 
It will. It will. What, what I like about this is I'm hoping what I'm trying to get to here is that think back in your life as a math person. If someone threw that up at you, right, just put that on a piece of paper and showed that to you, you'd probably look at that and be like, okay, that's, that's math beyond what I know right now, right? I mean, that looks like math, doesn't it? I mean, that looks like true, like mathematics right there. But hopefully what you're seeing is that it actually makes sense. Like it's connected to something and it comes from something and it means something, right? It's not just a bunch of jumbled letters and symbols and it, it actually, that generates something that we want to know, right? This is simply the width of a rectangle. This is the height of a rectangle. This just counts out your right endpoints, right? That's all that does. This adds them up and this makes you have an infinite number of them, right? So it's not as complicated maybe as it may look. So I, I just don't want you to be as intimidated by things like this as you might initially be, okay? All right, uh, now let's do an example. All right. What I'd like for us to do now, that formula, uh, I'm gonna apply it, so I'm gonna use it now. Find area under f of x equals x cubed on the interval 2, 5. I should also say something before we do this example. Um, I know that some of you know that we're going to be able to do this problem very easily in a little while with the antiderivative and it will be simple. And you might wonder why it is that I'm showing you all the Riemann sums. And the reason is because Riemann sums are very much connected to series, which we will be studying later. And just getting the whole idea of the notation and adding things up forever, understanding that concept now is important. So I, don't, I didn't want to skip over Riemann sums and just it all of a sudden pops up later and you're like, what, what was that symbol again? So, all right. Let's use the formula. The area under this curve should be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity, right, of, okay, summation, k equals 1 to n, of what? B minus a over n. What's b for us? 5 minus 2, so 3. So 3 over n. F of a plus k b minus a over n. So what is f for us in this problem? X cubed. X cubed. So aren't I going to do this then? Aren't I going to take the, the a, which for us is what? 2 plus k times what's b minus a over n again? 3 over n. And I'm just going to take all that and do what with it? Cube it. Does everyone see that this is f of a plus k times b minus a over n? No? Okay. You do get it or do you don't? You don't get it? Okay. Um, this piece right here is supposed to be f of a plus k times b minus a over n. In the formula, that's what it is, right? Okay, what's a for us in this problem? 2. Okay, b minus a over n, we already said is 3 over n, right? But now take that and plug it into the function. Well, what's our function here? It's x cubed. So I'm taking all of this and cubing it. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, you got that? Now, let's just appreciate right now how difficult this would be to do now from here on out. What I need to do is cube this, right? I need to cube that, which means I'd have to do basically 2 plus 3k over n 
times itself three times, which means I'm going to get a cubic polynomial in k and n. So I'm going to have n cubes and k cubes in there. It's going to be a mess, right? So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. Okay, this is the formula for it. If I can compute that, I've got the true area, don't I? If I can do it. So let's stop real quick. We'll come back and compute it in a second. Let's do the same thing. I want to find the area under f of x equals e to the x on the interval 1, 3. Take a moment to see if you can come up with this formula. All I want is the formula and then stop. See if you can write out that formula yourself. And if you get that one, then do another example and try and write out the formula for f of x equals cosine x on the interval 0 pi. When you get an answer to one of these, let me know and I'll come by and take a look. Let's see if who our speed demons are. This is all right, but what is f of that? What is the function you've got to plug? See, you, you, we got to take this part right here and plug it into our function. In this problem, it was, oh, plugging it in means cubing it. What does it mean for you to take that and plug it into your function? What's your function? E to the x. It's what? E to the x. E to the x. So, what, if it was x, you, I would just put the x here. But, but this is your x. This is the part that's going up oh, there. So e to, the, e to all that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me see. Yep. That's it. Yep. You started with two. Um, hold on. You should have three over. Did I write the problem down wrong? Oh, I wrote it. It should be two. Yeah. Sorry. I was looking at the wrong answer over here. Oh, okay. Yep. So two over n e to the oh. one. Plus. It should be one plus. Did you have k as one? Nope, because a is one. Because a is one. So this is right then, right? Yeah, let me see here. So two over n. Two over n e to the one plus k. Is that that's k, right? Yes, sir. K two. Yeah, that's right. Is that raised to something again or no? The x the x is that thing. Yeah, that's So it's just e to that thing. You making any progress? No? Okay, so what part what part are you stuck on? Um, the whole thing? See, this is like the same thing I had problems with on the take home quiz. Like okay. Get to a certain point and then like, the, the formula, the formula, where's your formula? Okay, this is your formula, right? You just have to identify what A and B. You got A and B, right? So you should be able to plug in get this number, this number, and then this, right? That, sh that should give you that. It's just the function itself. That looks good. Yep. E to that. Yep, F's out of there. F is the E. Your function is the E. Okay. So it's just 2 over n times E to that junk up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Everyone's happy here? Let me see. Two over n. That's right. And pi over n cosine. Okay, I believe that's right. Let me see. Okay. Yep. That looks good. So see if you, everyone on the table can agree with that. Yes. Okay. I'll be there. Hold on.
Okay, so here, this piece right here needs to be plugged into the function, right? So your function is e to the x. So it's, it's the x. I don't know how to say it without drawing. This part right here is the function with that plugged in, right? So for you, your function is e to the x, right? Your x is that, that part, the a plus k b minus a over n. For that particular example. Does that make sense? OK. And then plug that, yes. Uh -huh. All right, so how about over here? Do you, do, or is everyone kind of happy with this? Yep. OK. These are good. So if everyone's on that page, then we're good. All right, so we got two isolated. What you're missing is taking that and plugging it into the function. Oh, so okay. you've got to take this piece and plug it into this function, which means it's got to replace this. So this piece right here should be e to the okay. all that junk. And then on this one, you got to take that and plug it in the function, so it should be cosine of that junk. Okay? And then don't forget all that sum stuff. How are you doing out here, sir? This is good. That's e to that, right? Okay, that's good. All right, so check this out. We've got about 20 minutes left. Most of you have the answer. Uh, it's k plus k times. K times pi n, pi over, yeah. All right. When I was a student many, many years ago, there was not Wolfram Alpha, okay? <laughs> How many of you have heard of Wolf, Wolfram? Is that right? Yes. How many of you have heard of Wolfram Alpha? Okay. Wolfram Alpha, from what I've heard, has saved many students' lives in many math courses. And there's an app for that. And there's an app for it also, yeah. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you some of the power of Wolf, Wolfram Alpha and just so you know, this semester you can go to this website to get some sort of help as far as getting answers. Yes? You don't have like the subscription to it, right? Do I have the subscription to Wolfram Alpha? I, I own the program that is the kernel to the Wolfram Alpha. So when, when Wolfram Alpha goes and computes something, it uses what's, call, what's called Mathematica. That's the program. And I have that program. He said, I am Wolfram. But it doesn't, but it doesn't, um, you know how Wolfram Alpha will like show steps? Mathematica doesn't do that part of it. Okay, so if you could please uh, kill the lights for me. I'm going to show you something. Now I do want to say to everyone, I, I am trying to keep up with technology, okay? I, I get the importance of technology, but I also understand the importance of not depending on technology. So like I said, I, you know, when I learned math, we didn't have a TI-89, I didn't have a TI-89, I didn't have Wolfram Alpha, you know, those sorts of things, that technology wasn't there, so a lot of what we did was, was really, you, you had to grind that crap out. So I don't want you to become a Cal2 student who needs this all the time to get you through. Check your work, yes. Do your work, figure it out for you, no. All right, so, but we need to see the power of it too. So I'm gonna go to Wolfram Alpha. And let's look at that first problem that we were doing, the X cubed one. Remember where we stopped? Wolf, let's see. Wolf, ups, first thing. Hmm. So go to Wolfram Alpha, and it says enter what you want to calculate. So what do we want to calculate? It's a sum, but it's also a limit, right? So I'm going to start with the limit. I'm going to go limit, limit, parentheses. Okay, what do I want? Limit of a what? Sum, 
right? Sum, sum of what? What was that first problem? Let's do the x cubed one. So it was 3 over n. So I'm going to go uh, 3 divided by n times. Now I need parentheses because I'm going to cube it, right? So 2 plus k times 3 divided by n. Don't worry about writing all this down. Sorry, I have a handout for you that has all this typesetting already done. Okay, just pay attention to what I'm doing. Sorry, I forgot to say it. So it's uh, k times 3 over n. All of that cubed, right? I want to sum that. Now watch. Sum from where to where? From... No, no, the sum. In our summation, where does our sum start and stop? 1, 2, n, right? Okay, so I'm taking the limit of a sum. The sum is 3 over n times blah, blah, blah cubed, and I'm summing that from 1 to n, and I closed off my sum, right? That's what I want to sum. And what's the limit I'm trying to do? Limit is what? n n with a minus sign and a right arrow would mean n goes to infinity. Let it go. Hit enter. Or hit this. I don't know which one's going to. Oh no, it's what? Well, this worked on my computer, so. Is it because you're missing a parentheses after the cubes? No. All right, well, here, that's why I brought handouts. Am I? Broke the matrix. Here, one, two, three, four. There. Yeah, the Wolfram Alpha is pretty smart. It, it figures it out. It, it tries something at least. Here, just take some of these. Sure, you don't fire. Yeah, that's another thing. I should probably be using a different browser. There we go. So this is a front and back. Let's see if I have it typed in exactly the way I did it the other day. Uh, limit sum 2k, 3 over n. I put the 3 over n in parentheses. I don't think that's going to make a difference. The first 3 over n? The first 3 over n is in parentheses. What? I can try that. No, K. K from one to n. After oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't, I didn't put from K, K from one to n. But it looks like it's trying here. There we go. All right, there. So it's pretty smart, but it's not perfect. So you see the type setting in that? I did, I did three examples here for you. Because on your homework, it says on, for 5.1, numbers 15 and 16, it says use a computer algebra system to find the area or something like that. This is what I want you to do. So I want you to figure out the formula first like you just did in class, and then just come to Wolfram Alpha and figure it out, all right? And this is the answer. 609 over 4 is the exact area. Okay? Um, we're not quite done. Let's turn the lights back on. Do you mind hitting those lights? We still... Yes. Wolfram Alpha. Yep. 
If you have a TI-89, your TI-89 will do it also. But you can't type it in like that. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to make the final connection. Hopefully, the final connection, because I don't want to do it next class. The final connection we have is this. When we are trying to find the area under a curve, like this, right? What we did is we took a rectangle in here, right? We took a basic rectangle. That rectangle had a width of delta x, right? The height of that rectangle was f of something, right? That right endpoint? that right endpoint, which I'm going to call x tilde sub k. Now, all that's telling you, all I want you to see in this, x tilde is just to say, hey, look, it's not just any point. It's the right endpoint. And the k means that those do change. Every rectangle has a different value, doesn't it? And I'm adding them up. So I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from k equals 1 to n of what? All the rectangle's areas, which would be f of x tilde k delta x. That's a very s condensed form of what I just wrote on the board, isn't it? Without all the endpoints and stuff. This is how high each rectangle is. This is how wide each rectangle is, yes? Yeah. Okay, so now I, I have 10 minutes. I should be able to do this. For antiderivatives, we have a notation for it, a new notation that we're going to put up here. It goes like this. That sounds important. So here's a little f of x, right? Here's a little f of x right there. And I'm trying to tell you, hey, take the antiderivative of it, right? Up to this point, I've just said, hey, find the antiderivative, right? But if I put this symbol in front of it, like this, and I throw in this little dx over here, that's basically me saying, find the antiderivative of a little f. This symbol is called the integral sign. No. Integral sign. And this right here is called the differential. And we're not going to be too concerned with the differential right now just getting the notation. What I want you to understand is that that symbol means go get me the antiderivative, okay? Go find the antiderivative of this function right here. This function inside is called the integrand. So it's kind of like when you had radical signs. The thing underneath the radical is called the radicand. The thing inside of the integral is called the integrand. So that's just some notation. Now the big, like, ending for the day, all right? It turns out that for areas under curves, the limit as n goes to infinity of the summation k equals 1 to n of f of x sub x tilde sub k delta x. That's just our kind of short way of writing all that crap that we just came up with on our own, right? If you add up all the rectangles and you make there be an infinite number of them, it turns out that that answer is just the antiderivative of the function, right? That means antiderivative of the function 
but with what we call these limits of integration, which I have to explain to you, which just turns out to be capital F of B minus capital F of A. So I'm throwing a lot of, on the board here at the end, but it's, it'll all start to come together to next class. So this sum of infinite number of rectangles is just, at the end of the day, the antiderivative, right, the antiderivative of our function evaluated at the two endpoints of the interval. That's all it is. So if you take your homework problem, right, you had that homework problem that you were supposed to do? Your quiz? Uh, it was x squared, right? You had that f of x equals x squared, and you're asked on the, z on the interval 0, 2 to find the area, right? Well, if you can use this instead of all the rectangles, infinite number of them, then we're saying, what's the antiderivative? a and b are 0 and 2, x squared dx. Well, that should just be the antiderivative evaluated at the endpoints, right? I'm going, to leave an e, I'm going to leave a space here. Do the same. It's capital F of 2 minus capital F of 0, isn't it? If I can find the antiderivative. What is the antiderivative of x squared? 1 third x cubed. So the way, that, the way that we'll do this in class is that we're going to, instead of going from here to there, we're going to have one little intermediate step. What we're going to do is we're actually going to write the antiderivative down. That's the antiderivative, right? And then we'll put a line next to it and we'll put 0, 2. And that's just so that we have written down this antiderivative and then we keep in track what we're going to plug into it. We're going to plug 2 into it, right? And we're going to subtract what we get when we plug in 0. So why don't you plug 2 in real quick? What do you get? 1 third times 2 cubed, right? Minus one third times zero cubed. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I said one third, didn't I? One third, two cubed. So that gives us what? Eight thirds. Eight thirds. That's what you should have got on your take-home quiz. Or two point six, yeah. which is a lot less work, isn't it? Yes. Sure. Okay, so how about that problem that I just had Wolfram Alpha do? The limit n goes to infinity. What did it come out to? 609 over what? Okay, what was the function? It was x cubed on what interval? 2 to 5? Okay, so let me do the same thing. If I try x cubed on 2 to 5, then according to my notation, this should be integral See, 2 and 5 here, here's x cubed dx, right? What's the antiderivative of x cubed? 1 fourth x to the fourth, evaluated from, let's see, 2 to 5, right? 2 and 5, or my 2? So I plug which one in first? 5, what's 5 to the fourth power? What is it? 625. So 625 over 4 minus, now plug 2 in. Sixteen? 16 over 4? And if you subtract those, you get 609 over 4, don't you? Now, I still have three minutes. You have to give me this three minutes because we need the, I just don't feel like I've completely connected it yet. Um, we are not going to prove in this class why it is that this works, okay? You, that's saved for a rigorous math course. I mean, that's what the mathematicians will do is they, they show that this is true that those Riemann sums become this and that all you have to do is evaluate at the, t and at the end points of the antiderivative. That's, that's not for this class. But by the Riemann sums, I hope you now appreciate how great this is.
It saves us so much time. You never plug in the two? Pardon me? You never plug in the two? I did. Okay. Two, 16 over 4 right here. Yeah. yeah. So this is f of b minus f of a. Yeah? And then there. <clears throat> All right. Wait. Here we go. Watch this. Uh, you just have to watch this. We said sum f tilde k delta x, right? That just adds up n rectangles, doesn't it? If I let n go to infinity, I actually get the true area. Do you see the relationship between that and this? Can you see how these two are connected to each other now? Look, if I take my function and I say, hey, look, I want the area underneath that. I say, OK, I'm going to make a rectangle, right? How wide is that rectangle going to be? Delta x. How tall is it? f of x. Something like that, right? Let there be an infinite, let there be an infinite number of them. The, the change in x becomes the dx. Okay? And this just becomes f of x. Height, width. Do you see that? Height of rectangle, width of rectangle. That's all it is. This means infinite number of them. So there is a very, very tight connection between integral sign and this. Now, why is that important in my last 30 seconds? Because we're going to come up with some formulas later. Like I'm going to take this function, and I, think, I don't think I showed you this. Maybe I did. We're going to take it, we're going to wrap it around the x-axis. So we're going to take this function, instead of it being two-dimensional on a flat piece of paper, we're going to take it, and we're just going to drop it and make it go around the x-axis. So if I do that, won't I create a three-dimensional solid object like this? Let's just say it'll look like something like this. Let's just say, yes? How would you find the volume of that? Well, I'm going to show you, and, and I've got negative time now. I'm going to take one rectangle, OK? I'm going to take one rectangle, and I'm going to wrap it around the x-axis. What would I get if I wrap one rectangle around the x-axis? What would I get here? I'd get that, wouldn't I? Just like a disk or something, right? Can you tell me what the volume of that is? Well, what's a cylinder's volume? You could look in your book. Pi r squared times h. Pi r squared times h. What is the radius of this piece? That's your f of x. Isn't it the height of your rectangle? OK. So if I'm trying to find pi, pi r squared um, h, if I'm following that formula for this, then I have pi. The radius is my function squared times the height. How high is it? Delta x. It's, isn't it how wide my rectangle is? Delta x. So how would you try and find the true volume? You add up all those little slivers, don't you? So my integral should look like this. Integral a to b of what, though? Pi f of x squared dx. dx, oh, I forgot to square the function. Radius squared pi. That gives you the volume of it wrapped around the x-axis. And everything you do in this class and in Cal 3, in Cal 3 you're doing triple integrals where you're trying to find you know, volumes of three-dimensional solids or you're trying to find like electri electric flux going in and out of surfaces. All of it is based on the idea of taking something geometrically, coming up with a formula, and then adding it up forever. All right, sorry if I blew you away there. Um, your homework has already been established, right? No quiz due. Y'all have a good day.